you have the Bibles, you can go to the book of Esther. Go to the book of Esther. And they did do a good job, didn't they? Okay. Yeah. And I want to thank you again for your, your help. You did it. Hey, you got some bragging rights. I'm going to brag about you. Okay? I'm going to brag about you when I get back at the yard. Okay? Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, so again, thank you for your, your sacrifice and, and uh, helping us out here. And my wife would come down as well, but you know it's always fun to come to church, and, and uh, I like I like doing things like that. So, praise the Lord, and, and it's and God will reward us in different ways. Some may know that. Yeah. It's not always about position or title or anything like that. And we're not above anything. Amen. Hallelujah. I mean, I'll, I'll shine your shoes. Amen. And I've never been too proud. Amen. I, I always love to. I love to work. Amen. I, now, as a young man, I used to shovel horse manure to make money. Amen. Come on. Didn't matter to me. Amen. I was going out there to work. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, anyways, I, I, the Lord made it out of my heart, and uh, and the message is called "Stand Up." Standing up and standing out. Standing up and standing out. Now, every day in the news, if you watch the news, and it's kind of depressing to watch the news a lot of times, but it always seems that mostly everything that they talk about, uh, everything that I hear, most of it, is all uh, with a negative undertone. You know what I'm talking about? It's always something negative. And if you pay attention to the news, it seems like the whole world is out of balance. And the number one thing I believe that the enemy wants to do in the church and in the world is to cause division, to cause imbalance, and, and, and to get us uh, to where, where we are not uh, accepting one another with no climate of acceptance. And in this imbalance, the enemy wants to cause separation in the world and in the church. He doesn't want unity. Someone said it this way, division is dangerous and demonic in its nature. Division is dangerous and demonic in its nature. See, I believe God has directed me to speak this this morning, standing up and standing out. And that God uses His people to stand up and stand out in the midst of division and unrest and turmoil. I know uh, I've, I've, throughout my lifetime, and we've all been through this, that there's times of, there's times when things are going great. Can somebody say that? Amen. I love those kind of times. I mean, you better hang on to them with all you got. Thank God for the good times because there's always bad times too. Amen. Come on. And so we got to learn to really balance out and stand up and stand out even in the times of, of difficulty. <clears throat> in the Bible, there was a woman by the name of Esther. She stood up and stood out even when it was unpopular. She took matters into her own hands and really made a difference to change the course of history. God used Esther. That is to stand up against an evil man's plot. How many know there's always evil that's lurking in the midst? Sticking its ugly head out. And so God uses this woman named Esther to fight against the, the, the evil plot of a man by the name of Haman. The Bible says that it, we need to understand this, that God knows what's happening. Uh, you, you look in the Bible, throughout all throughout the Bible, you see that God always knows what's happening. <clears throat> in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. That God knows, God is all knowing. I believe it's 120 different times in the Bible it speaks about that God is all knowing. He knows what's going on. Amen. So there's nothing that gets away from God that God knows. Can you say amen? He knows what you're going through. He knows before you even go through it. And so he knows everything about you. As a matter of fact, every one of your hairs on your head are, are numbers. If God knows the number for some of us. That's not that much. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Say amen, you can laugh if you want to. Come on. <laughs> and, and, and it's okay, because that's the way God designed us. How many know that 
We all come in different variations. We're different people. We come from different backgrounds. We, 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 we have come from different walks of life. But here in the Bible, God was fully aware that what was going to happen. And Esther, the Bible says, became queen of Persia. And it was God Almighty that positioned her to rise up and stand against the demonic forces that were intended to create a division and ultimately attempt to destroy all of the Jews that were in Persia. How many have ever felt like that? The enemy wants to destroy you and destroy your family or destroy your life. So Haman was actually a Jew Haman. And, and like we hear today, you hear it over and over again that that guy's a racist. That guy's a racist. She's a racist. They hate this ethnic group. They hate that ethnic group. Well, way back from the very beginning, the enemy has always tried to bring division against people. It's not always the color of your skin, but it's dislikes, what you don't like. You know, I mean, I, I've actually been around people and, and where, you know, they just rub me wrong and automatically I kind of make a, 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 an assumption of who they are and, and I, you know, I don't want to be around them. Has anybody ever done that? And so what happens is many times just before we even know somebody, and we only read the cover of the book, but we don't know what they've been through. And see, what God wants you to understand is that we all go through things and you don't know about everybody. You don't know what they're going through. But let me tell you this, God knows everything. He knows everything about you. There's nothing that you went through that God does not understand. And God is always there. And you need to be ready for God to intimately come into your life and to change your situation. And sometimes God will use one person, one individual, to change the course of history. Esther stood up against this man named Haman. Haman was appointed above all the servants to be the prime minister of, uh, of Persia by uh, the king Xerxes. 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 Now the names are hard to say. By Xerxes. And he was told that everybody that would come around him must bow down to him. How many know that some people get positioned? It's like, hey, you know what? I've got position. You need to uh, understand my authority and, and bow down. How many know we bow down to only one person, and that is God? Amen. Amen. We don't bow to man. And so there was a man by the name of Mordecai that understood that, you know what, I only bow to one man, one God, and that is God alone, Jesus Christ. He is the, the triune God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is the only one that I bow down to. Let's pick it up in Esther chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Sometime later, King Xerxes promoted Haman, son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, to prime minister, making him the most powerful official in the empire, in, in, in the empire next to the king himself. And all the kings and the officials would bow down before Haman to show him respect whenever he passed by. For so the king had commanded, but Mordecai <laughs> refused to bow down to show him any respect. Now, if you know anything about Haman, Haman was an Agagite from uh, uh, he was from Amalek, and, and he naturally they hated the Jew, so he didn't want anything to do to, uh, to do with the Jew. And so the Amalekites uh, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, Amalek here. And it was a was a was a son or grandson of Esau, and so Mordecai refused to bow down to this man, knowing that he hated the Jew. But he also <laughs> knew that he could never bow down to anything except God Himself. He knew the the law of God, and he only obeyed the law of God. You know what? It would do us good sometimes to understand the Bible just a little bit better, mm. because a lot of times we do things that are just completely out of character as believers. And it bleeds over into our life. Can somebody say amen? We allow certain things to, to come into our life that the enemy uses against us. And so there's things that we need to understand is that there is a time and a place that where you and I need to stand up for the things of God and not bow down to the calls and the popularity of the world. Can somebody say amen? Mm -hmm. In Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 7, the Bible says... Do not worship any other God besides me. 
Do not make idols of any kind, whether it is the shape of birds or animals or fish. You must never worship or bow down to them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not share your affection with any other God. I do not leave unpunished the sins of those who hate me, but I, listen to this, but I punish the children for their sins of their parents to the third and the fourth generation. Now you've heard that, you've heard about generational curses? But verse 10, check this out. But I lavish my love on those who love me and obey my commands even for a thousand generations. You know, I, I, I want my, my generations after me, my heritage after me to serve God. So if I want them to serve God, it means that I must wholly give my life over to God to be an example in the Father, like you were talking about today. If you give a dollar, your kid knows you made a thousand dollars. Amen. You didn't give your tithes. Come on. <laughs> As Brother Jose so eloquently said it. And if you gave one dollar, that means you only gave you only made ten dollars. Well, how do you live off ten dollars? And, 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 and your character always comes out. The, the way that you believe will always come out. That is why every day we need to walk, uh, uh, the Bible says, appropriately with our character intact and live it out in our lives. I'm not saying that you don't make mistakes. I'm not saying that we don't go through rough times and pains and, and things that we go through. But I am saying that through it all, amen, we need to keep our focus upon God and believe God and live the best we can now, I know that we're not perfect, but we're going to allow God to begin to transform us and change us over into the image of Christ. And every day that we live, amen, we become a little bit more focused and a little bit more like God. Can somebody say amen? amen. Now, I, I have a stinky character inside of myself. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, he said, you know, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. But he said, you know, if, he says, if it wasn't for the grace of God, he even says, there I go. He says, you know what? I thank God for his grace and his mercy in my life. But he says, I continue to do the things that I don't want to do. And the things that I do want to do, I don't do them. And so we are continually being challenged to become more like Jesus. The Bible says in Haman he was a mad man. He got mad at Mordecai because he wouldn't revere him and bow down to him. And so because of one man wouldn't bow down to Mordecai, he says, you know what? We're going to wipe out all the Jews. Does that sound like a nice guy? Yeah. Right, you made a mistake, brother. So you know what's going to happen to you? Oh, I'm wiping out your whole family. Come here. Hey. And Brutus, come in. Hey, you see that man over there? Not only take him out, he disrespected me, but you know what? Kill everyone in his heritage. And this is the heart of Haman. He was a man that had hate. He was a man that was prideful. And a man that had hate. If he wanted everybody to bow down and to, to serve him and to revere him. In Esther 3, chapter 6. It says, so he decided it was not enough to lay hands on Mordecai alone, but to kill all the Jews. Listen, church, sometimes the devil is not happy just to divide your personal relationship with God. Sometimes the devil is not happy just to divide your personal relationship with God. He will go after your family and all those that you love. Say amen. Amen. You see, since we, he had learned that Mordecai was a Jew, he decided, you know what I'll do? I'll destroy all the Jews throughout the whole empire of Xerxes. And Haman went on to the king, and he secured a consent in writing to offer a bribe. In other words, he was bribing. Nobody wanted to kill the Jews. And he goes over to the king and gets a written decree that he's able to go out and kill all the Jews. Now let's pick it up first, day. Then Haman approached King Xerxes and said, There is a certain race of people scattered through all the provinces of the empire, and their laws are different from those of any other nation, and they refuse to obey even the laws of the king. So it is not good that the king's interest let them live. Listen to this. Verse 13 says, 
and he sent out by messengers into all the provinces of the empire the letters of the decree that all the Jews, listen to this, young and old, including women and children, must be killed and slaughtered and annihilated on a single day. Kill them all. In one day span. Well, fortunately, Mordecai had heard of the decree and it concerned him because he was a Jew and it concerned him for all his people. You know what, church? We need to be concerned about the people that are here in the church. Amen. We need to be concerned for each other. There needs to be a love and a respect and a climate of acceptance in the church. Amen. Not everybody is like you. Not everybody thinks like you, but we are gathered together. Amen. Under, under, the, under the, the almighty grace of God, God has graced us to be here, and we need to learn to love each other and accept each other in our differences and all our flaws. Amen. The church should be like a body and fingers, God, that when you come in, you are damaged from being wrecked in the world, but the bottom was put on, you are repolished, and you go back out on the showroom floor with no flaws at all. That's the way that we should look at God's people. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Fortunately, Mordecai heard of the decree that had been sent out. So he sends it to Esther, the young lady that he had adopted, which is a beautiful story because it was like her uncle really that adopted her and, and he raised her up and he loved her like a father. How many know we need to love on folks? Amen. That people get beat up all day long. All day long. And, and I've learned over the years, the older I get, that I find out, man, people are just flat out. Mean. We were talking about it the other day at Starbucks. Man, there's some mean people. Isn't that right? I mean, they're just hateful. They're belligerent. They're mean. They have no kindness. The, the Bible says, let the law of kindness rule your heart, but there's no law of kindness in their heart. They're just plain mean. I mean, my wife told me I'm mean at times. Did it ever happen to you? Amen. She said, you're mean. And, and, and I, you know what I learned that when my wife says that, I learned to listen. That's why I gave, God gave us two ears and one mouth. <laughs> <laughs> that we would listen more, twice as much as we speak. <laughs> Say amen or on me. <laughs> and, and, and so what happens in, in, in relationship with people, and so he sends a copy to the young lady that he raised up that became the queen, the wife of King Xerxes, and, and he sends it to, to one of her servants. The more guy sends Esther this letter and, and that she would and he requests that she would go on and for the behalf of all the Jews and speak up and for their reprieve. And now let's pick it up in Esther chapter 4, verse 5 through 8. Then Esther sent for Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs who had been appointed as her attendant. And she ordered him to go to Mordecai and to find out what was troubling him and why he was mourning. So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the square in the front of the palace gate. Mordecai told him the whole story and told him how much money Haman had promised to pay the royal treasury for the destruction of all the Jews. And Mordecai gave Havoc a copy of the decree and he issued, that was issued in Susa that called for the death of all Jews and he asked, he asked Havoc to show it to Esther. So he also asked Havoc to explain to her, to urge her to go before the king and to beg for mercy and to plead for her people. Now, Esther had got the copy that was sent to her by her uncle and, and, and she sends back notice to Mordecai that it, that's in, really in, in disarray, he's hurting, and, and his whole countenance has fallen. And she sends a letter back to her uncle and says these words, You know what, I must obey the king. I can't just go into the king's court. 
and I can't enter his court unless he summons me to come in or he puts out his golden scepter now and when I'm standing in the inner court and it had been 30 days since he asked her to come into the court. And so for her going in and trying to plead for her people, the Jews, and by the way, he, she never told uh, the king that she was a Jew. She had never said anything. You know, sometimes it's better off. Some things, let me just tell you this. Some things are better off not to be said. And so she never told Xerxes that she was a Jew. And now Haman, he hates Jews. He doesn't realize that the king is married to a Jewish woman that had kept her mouth shut. And so uh, he, now he wants to kill all the Jews and she finds out about it. And she sends back a note to or word to her uncle Mordecai saying, I can't, I have to spend 30 days since I've gone. And then he gets the note and he realizes, you know what, I've got to do something. I've got to speak something into her life because of the one to stand up and take courage and faith and believe and go before the king to plead the case for the Jewish people. Now let's pick it up. The message is really the challenge of the whole book of Esther. In verse 14 of chapter 4, listen to his words. If you keep quiet at a time like this, listen, if you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. What's more, who can say, now listen to this, this is very important, who can say, but that you have been elevated to the palace for such a time as this. So Esther heard these words, and now you need to think about this. He's saying, Esther, I raised you up, and I, I didn't get into the whole story because it had been a lot, but there was a whole year that women had were getting beauty, they get beauty treatments and everything for a year, all those that were chosen, and he chose Esther. He loved her more than any other woman throughout all Persia to be his wife. And now he's saying, you know what he's saying? You know what, you need to do something. And I believe God has strategically positioned you as the king's wife because, listen, your people are going to be killed. My blood and your blood are going to be killed. And how do you know that God had positioned you in this place for such a time as this? Yes. Now is the time for you to speak up, Esther. Yes. How many know there's a time to speak up? Yes. The Bible says the time to be quiet and the time to speak. And I'll tell you what, when, when you begin to see somebody that's gossiping or, or tearing down leadership or, or tearing down those that you love in the church, and what you need to do is you need to speak up and say, you know what, let's not have it, amen. Let's stop it right here on the spot. Let's put this thing in its place and let's put things back in order and love each other enough to keep a balance, a healthy balance in the church so we're not speaking evil of one another. I'd say this has happened in our church, but it's just a story here. So Esther had heard this. You know what? How do you know that God hadn't placed you in the position for such a time as this? And Esther acts quickly. And she sent word to Mordecai to gather all who were in Shushan and to fast for three days and three nights. And she promised that she would do the same. Let's pick it up in verse 16. The Bible says, And go gather all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days and nights. My maids and I will do the same. And then though it is against the law, I will go in to see the king. And if I must die, I am willing to die. She's saying, you know what? I'm willing to put my life down on the, put my life on the line and to go before the king, not being summoned. Because if you went before the king and hadn't been asked to go in there, unless he held out that golden scepter, you were dead. And so she had made it up in her mind that, you know what, she, she made up a, made a valuable statement that if I die, I, will, I am willing to die. That if I perish, I will perish for my people. You know, there's something about, the Bible says there's no greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. Yes. And so there's something here. Esther had a courage, and it took great courage to do what she did. And in Esther 5.12, the Bible said that she dressed in royal apparel and stood in the inner court and had not been invited in to see the king. So she's putting her life out on the line here. 
the king was on his throne. The Bible says that he held out his golden scepter, and Esther watched up, walked up, and touched the scepter. Now I want to show you something because the Lord God of Israel was at work. Sometimes you may be thinking, you know what, God, I don't know what we're going to do. How many have thought that maybe this week? Uh, how many have ever, you know, let's just say it this way. You're just overburdened by bills. That ever happened? Come on. I, I got a, a, a disability with my legs, and, and, and guess what? How much money I got last month? $600 for the whole month. <laughs> I'm like, how are we going to do it? How are we going to make it? Can I tell you something? Amen. I put it in the Lord's hands, and everything worked out. Amen. You know that old song, I've got a feeling everything is going to be all right. <clears throat> and what you've got to do is begin to trust God in the midst of your circumstance, in the midst of what you're facing. It may not be what you want it to be, but God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above everything that we ask or think because our God is able. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> now what you need to understand is many times we must stand up even when it hurts the most, we must stand up and trust God. And I want to tell you something prophetically. If you are here today and you feel like you're not going to make it, let me tell you something. Stand up like Esther did. And she said, if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to stand up for what is right. I am not going to quit. Amen. I am willing to die for what I know is right. And when you do that, amen, you can bring it up. Yes, I have my perrier here, but that's okay, too. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you. <coughs> my kids keep telling me, Dad, that's not water. That's soda. <coughs> I don't like water. So i gotta get, I got to get used to drinking water now, right? <laughs> So she goes in before the king, and I want you to notice she, the king had put out the golden scepter and he called her in. She walks up, touches the scepter. She's the queen to the king. She's his wife. Then listen, look at Esther chapter five, verse three. The Bible says, "Then the king asked her, what do you want, Queen Esther? What is your request? I will give it to you in even half of my kingdom." You know what? That's what God wants. God is looking for you to have enough faith to stand in the end of court when it hurts the most and trust God. Amen. And, 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 and take your life into your hand. Amen. She says, if I perish, I perish. She walks up. He pulls out the golden scepter. She walks up. She touches the golden scepter. How many of this is God working in the middle of faith and courage? See, that's how God works. He works in the middle of faith and courage. Esther set up the area at that point. She was she exonerated her uncle. Amen. She had begins to plead against the evil plot of Haman. And the king found out what Haman had done. Amen. It was bribery. He began to bribe those that, that would begin to hate the Jews and say, listen, we're going to take all this money and give it all to you. If you wipe out every Jew, everyone will be, everyone will be paid off. Amen. So just go kill them. And you know, that's, that's insanity. Can I tell you something, folks? Esther spoke up with courage and informed the king. I want to tell you something. Today, there is an all-out attack on the church. Amen. There is an all-out attack against the leaders. There is an all-out attack against the heart of the church, attacking people. We should have a love and acceptance for them. Haman had an agenda. He wanted to be the big shot, and he was a prideful man, and Mordecai would not bow down to him, so he had a personal agenda and planned not only to kill Haman, uh, Mordecai, but to destroy every Jew, and, and, and he, he didn't realize he was even talking about the king's wife. And you're thinking, how would the king let this happen? Well, he already signed a decree. And so Mordecai says, listen, if you don't speak up and talk to this evil king, I mean, this evil man, Haman, and let the king know Xerxes what he'd done. I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Not only will your people die, but you're going to die because you didn't speak up. This is to somebody. Amen. You need to start speaking up on your behalf. 
You need to stand up against the enemy by faith. Stand in the court. Look the devil right in the eye and say, you know what? I've had enough. I've had enough of you ripping me off. I've had enough of you ripping off my people. Right. I've had enough of you messing with my life. And I really, if I perish, I perish. But I'm standing here now, and I'm telling you a fact, amen, that you're not going to do it. That man over there is a liar. He's a bribe. He, he bribed people, amen. And I'm standing up in the midst of the court. I'm standing up against the demonic, evil man, amen. And I will not let him do this anymore. And let me tell you, you're my husband, amen. You married me, Xerxes, and let me tell you what's really happening. Amen. I'm a Jew. And you know what he wants? He wants me killed too. <laughs> How many know God positionally puts you in places, amen, so he can bring you out and exonerate you against the evil plots of the enemy? Can somebody say amen? Amen. amen. Yes. The enemy's a liar. Don't you forget it. And so whatever you're going through today, whatever you're facing, Haman, he was the type of man who was unforgiving. He harbored a grudge. He was arrogant. Amen. As a matter of fact, you know, she already knew what she was going to do. And so Esther says, you know, we're going to have a, a banquet. And in this banquet, we're going to invite just this man here. And so she invites this man, Haman. He's all prideful. Man, you know, he goes back home, tells everybody, me and my wife went to the banquet. <laughs> And we're the only ones, man, amen. The king, the king, I, I, I'm his right-hand man. I'm the prime minister. And she said, now there's a second day you got to come back. And he comes back and he built a gallow to hang Mordecai on it, 75 feet high. And he comes in there swaggering. It feels like he's a big shot. But she didn't under, he didn't understand that he was walking into a dead trap. And whatever he had done, and let me tell you, whatever he had done against Mordecai had been reversed on him. Can I tell you something? God wants to reverse the curse that's been placed upon your life. Amen. He wants to turn it around. And so he comes in there thinking, okay, today's a good day. Mordecai, you're going to hang on the gallow that I built. He comes in and begins to talk to the king. But he didn't realize that his nasty rear end was going to be hanging upon that gallow. It wasn't going to be Mordecai. Because God had intervened. And not only, listen to this, not only did God intervene for Mordecai, and Haman died upon that uh, gallow, but not only that, check this out, amen. Hallelujah. He takes Mordecai and gives him the position that Haman had as the prime minister of Persia. The second highest position throughout all the land. Because, you know, what happened was is that he had never been told what a great man Mordecai was. You know, we need to start bragging on people a little bit. I'm going to brag about you a little bit. Amen. When I get back to the yard, brother, I'm off. Yeah. Tell that all the time. It's a joke. <laughs> we need to let people know, you know what, hey, you did a good job. <laughs> Thank you for your work. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your sacrifice. Amen. Thank you for your for leading worship. Thank you for cleaning the church. Thank you for painting. Thank you for working with the kids. Thank you for doing the outreach. Thank you for being here. Thank you for giving. Thank you for everything that you do. And so the king finds out that there had been an ambush. Was gonna, they were going to assassinate him. The two of us, the eunuchs, had thought, you know, we're going to kill the king. But old Mordecai, nobody had heard about anything about him, went in and sent news to the, the king's and, uh, helpers, and said, you know what, you need to get rid of these two eunuchs because they're going to assassinate the king. And he never finds out anything about it until now he wants to, Haman wants to hang him on the gallows. Then as he finds out, you know what, do you know what Mordecai even saved your life one time? Man, you know, we need to have some things written in stone a little bit about our life. We don't want just bad skeletons, but we want things in our past. There's at least a few little things. Not that we do everything perfect. We want some places that there's a real reference point in our life. Places that we can go back and refer to. You know what that guy did? You know what she did? Amen. That helped us get further. That really helped us. You know, I am looking for some more people like that. That we can refer back to and say, you know what? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for what you did. So it gets back to the king. Did he save my life? Will you hang that old 
devil came with a five gallon, 75 feet gallon. You tell Mordecai to come over here. Because I'm reversing the curse. And everything that Haman had, the prime minister, the second highest in command of all Persia, Mordecai, Mordecai, come up here, you just got a promotion. <laughs> But listen to me, it never would have happened if Esther hadn't stood up. The Bible says at such a time as this, she took a chance to do what was right, when it was unpopular. She took a chance to stand and intercord with the king when she should have could have died. And she says, you know what? If I have to perish, I'm willing to perish. If I have to die, I'm willing to die. But I'm going to stand up for what's right. You know, the truth is, most people are afraid to stand up when the going, the going is tough. But people of character, they don't quit. People of character, you know what? They stand up no matter what. You know, maybe there's a giant you're facing today. God is beginning to put, this is, this is to somebody. There's something you're facing today that seems like it's in, insurmountable. That you're never going to make it through it. But God is saying, don't be afraid. Stand in the inner court. Don't be afraid. Stand in there and trust me. If you're willing to take the chance, if you're willing to face the opposition, if you made up your mind that I'm going to stand up and I'm going to stand out, and if I perish, I perish. And whether you're, the majority is against you and, and, and whatever it is that is against you, a true man or woman of God will stand their ground. And, when there, and sometimes it's when there's only one that's willing to stand. How many have ever felt like, man, I'm alone? <coughs> if you've been with the Lord very long, you're going to feel that sometimes. Let me yeah. tell you. I felt that way. Even in, even in the church, folks, sometimes we battle things that are inner things that we go through, and we feel like we're all alone. Now, you're not alone, but you feel like that. You know what I'm talking about? And, and so it's a burden. It's a heavy burden. Things begin to burden you down, and, and, and so it begins to weigh upon you. You feel like, you know what? But let me tell you something. Amen? If you'll stand up like Esther did at the time you need to stand up, amen, God is about to break through upon you. Amen. And I claim it over this church. I claim it over your life. I claim it over your family, your children, your husband, your wife. I claim victory over you. Amen. Over your finances. I claim victory over whatever you're going through today. And I, I proclaim right now by the word of God that if you'll stand up in the inner court and believe God that no matter what you're facing, no matter what's been said about you, no matter how many crooked pointed fingers like, look at them. Hallelujah. Amen. I can't tell you how many people uh, where I worked at, man. I worked with a devil. You know, you guys, continue praying for me. But I worked with a guy who was a devil. Amen. Don't put this on the internet. <laughs> but he, he was a hateful, bitter man. And I stood my ground. And you know what? There are going to be times when you go through that. Let me tell you something else. Sometimes God will put somebody in your life that is, is your sad thing. And you put them there for a reason. The reason why they're put there is because God, and not only is God doing something in their life, but he's doing something in your life. And he's saying, the Bible says, iron sharpens iron. So that a brother sharpens the countenance of his friend. How many know that the kisses of an, uh, the, the kisses of, uh, of an, what is it? The kisses of a friend, how's it called? Tell me here. The kisses of a friend are better than, oh, the, the, the rebuke of a friend is better than the kisses of an enemy. Amen. You, you, anybody get rebuked on the way to church today? Uh, let, let, me, let me close with this. We're driving in to get our money to pay our ties. And I, I'm in a hurry because we've been on the phone. My wife's dad had a heart attack. We just got back from Arizona. My mom is, is deathly ill. So right after church, we're going to leave and go over and see her dad. And so we're heavy hearted today. But you know, as we go and we get our, our offering and, and we come to church today, 
Amen. My mind is a thousand different places. My poor wife's is too. And I pull her to the bank and I didn't see the stop sign and I didn't stop quick enough. And this lady pulls right in front of me and she was going fast, but it was all my fault too. She's like, and she's pointing her finger at me and cussing me out. And my flesh wanted to rise. I wanted to say, well, yeah, I did say, well, it's your fault too. I said, you know, my wife said, well, you know, you got to be careful. People are impatient today. Yes. <clears throat> There's no consideration for people. People make mistakes. <clears throat> we all make mistakes. But we need to stand up in the middle of whatever you've gone through and admit that you made mistakes and go on and trust God. Amen. And when it, the, the time is right for you to stand up for something that you did not do, something that you are not guilty for, amen, you stand up with your neck straight up, with your eyes focused, with the gaze yes. and the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and trust God, I'm going to stand in the inner court, and God is going to believe me, amen, he's going to recompense me, amen, he's going to give me what I need for me and my family, he's going to work it out. Amen. And today, let me say this. I have a feeling that everything is going to be all right. Yes. Amen. Yes. Stand to your feet. I have a feeling that everything is going to be all right. Yes. yes.